A man with an impossible mission to investigate headed for a government base that is under scrutiny with a plan that is too crazy to work. The man sneaked into the top secret area 51. But did he find anything? Was he able to get through the guards and cameras unnoticed? Or was he caught, detained and left with nothing? We'll find out today. Area 51 is known as a highly secretive, top secret, totally inaccessible and secure US government operations base, which many have tried to break into, to no avail of of course. But what most people don't know is that there was one man who was determined to carry out a mission to find answers, to conduct his own investigation into certain events, and he actually managed to get them and remain undetected for seven days in a closely monitored government base. His story is one full of guile, guile and a test of survival skills. And lucky for us, he documented the whole trip in a series about himself published in the Las Vegas Sun. We will now delve into an incredible excursion, the story of Jerry Freeman, an archaeologist and explorer who did not take no for an answer when it came to investigating and uncovering the truth. Shortly before he left, he spoke about his motivation for embarking on such a dangerous journey. The siren song is deafening, I am struck by the forbidden fruit. Archaeologist and anthropologist Jerry Freeman from California was 55. In April 1997, when he decided to make an unauthorized crossing of the forbidden area 51. He was an experienced adventurer. He was someone who always followed through on his projects with passion. And his latest project was the most ambitious of all. He wanted to take a specific route in Nevada to find never-before-seen clues that could reveal important details about U.S. history. The only problem was that the trek required crossing the forbidden territory of Area 51, but that didn't stop him either. Freeman has contacted the Las Vegas Sun. In preparation for the trip, Freeman contacted the Las Vegas Sunday. He thought that if his plan was uncovered by the authorities, he would surely be arrested. So he decided to talk to a reliable but neutral third party so that someone would know officially where he was and why he went to Area 51. As an experienced explorer, perhaps Freeman was simply taking safety precautions to ensure that search parties would come looking for him if he did not return. But perhaps part of his motivation was an entirely different goal. Jerry Freeman boldly announced his outlandish plan. I want the Air Force to know that there is nothing sinister about what I am doing. I am not interested in the military or their technology and secrets. I am solely interested in the history and culture of the place and its artifact. I am an archaeologist. That's all I want to do. He told the Las Vegas Sun. What prompted Jerry Freeman to take part in such a risky mission of investigation? But it was unclear what possessed Jerry Freeman to take part in such a risky mission investigation. The truth is that the information he was seeking was an exceptional treasure that could only be found deep within the secret zone 51, but his fascination did not arise from a desire to catch a UFO or to meet an actual alien. Rather, it had more to do with an infamous event that took place back in 1849, the beginning of history and the passing of the name of the famous Death Valley in the USA. An event that went down in history because of the incredible resilience of the group members who came together to overcome the relentless obstacles along the way. In a recorded segment from a radio show hosted by Art Bell in the late 90s, Freeman himself explains why this old American story made him infiltrate Area 51. The radio program is open to listening by Area 51 staff, but Freeman called in to share his impressive experience anyway. Freeman on the phone. I'm an archaeologist and I slipped into the top secret Area 51 last year. I walked 100 miles and was there for a week. Went so far that I was able to see everything from the other side. I'll tell you what, it was the most stunning thing I've ever done. Radio host. 
Why did you decide to go there? As an archaeologist, what sparked your interest in Area 51? Freeman I followed the Death Valley story about the group that got lost in 1849. Radio host Are you kidding? Freeman No, the group took a shortcut. As it turns out, it went through some parts of Area 51. Radio host So you just followed their trail, and the trail went through parts of Area 51? Freeman That's right. These people made the arduous journey across America in a van, leaving the eastern part of the United States. They were in pursuit of the tantalizing promise of prosperity offered by the California Gold Rush. History of the Origin of the Name Death Valley The Group's Journey in 1849 You may know the tragic story of Donner's group, who were trapped in a snowstorm in the mountains after trying to take a shortcut. They were forced to resort to cannibalism after the participants began to die due to the harsh conditions and lack of supplies. People in 1849, who made the journey just three years after Donner's 1846 group, took note of the details of this story and avoided making the same mistakes. But ironically, although they had stayed away from the snowy peaks, these travelers too were lost, disoriented and struggling to survive, this time under the hot desert sun. The story goes that the group, making their way westwards, reached the mountain range too late to cross it safely. That's when the tempting alternative of crossing the zone was chosen by them. Rumor had it that some members of the group chose to take the old route skirting the southern edge of the Sierras, which meant warmer weather, more stable terrain and presumably a safer route to travel even in the coming winter. The group, led by an experienced guide, Jefferson Hunt, decided not to take the old tried and tested route. Hunt made the decision to take the unfamiliar route. It was a poorly considered choice, for if Donner's group had taught him anything, it was that one should always take the tried and tested route. When the group was unable to find water along this new trail, they were forced to revert to the original plan, but this foolish risk was an expensive mistake and they lost seven days and valuable supplies in the process. After that, conflicting opinions and grievances only grew in the group. In the end, the journey led to the breakup of the group. And those who broke away from the hunt group took a very beautiful route and soon realized they were not mistaken. They came face to face with a stunning canyon that could not be crossed by van. Although most were discouraged by this outcome, a select few decided to carry on. And the strong spirit of these guys paid off and after a few days journey they found their way around the canyon. Soon the path led them to the Papoose Lake area, a landmark located in what is now Secret Area 51. Here another argument arose. The travelers were desperate for water. One group suggested a plan to head south to a snowy mountain where the ground is not as dry. But the other group disagreed. They stuck firmly to the original plan, not wanting to make any more mistakes. But even after each group had decided to go their separate ways, fate decided that the two groups would eventually meet again on Christmas Eve 1849 and continue their journey together which led them to what is now Death Valley. Although the weary people found temporary relief and were able to quench some of their needs, the weary group and their weary animals were in bad shape. They came to despair and separated again. Some gave up the wagon they had already endured so much grief that dragging all the stuff so far away was impossible. Instead they left them behind in the desert and continued on foot. They may have been on their last legs, but this group was in a position to successfully complete the journey and finally put an end to their days on the road. The others were less fortunate. After an unsuccessful attempt to cross the daunting mountain range, the last formidable barrier to civilization, they were forced to turn back and remain in Death Valley. While the two men were trusted to continue forward and provide supplies for the abandoned men. After a month and 300 miles of walking, the heroes returned to their waiting comrades. 
The two rescuers returned and saw that the situation was much worse than they had expected. Most were losing patience, or perhaps they had lost hope that the two scouts would return. Many had already left by the time the messengers returned. Eventually they were rescued. A total of 13 travelers are reported to have died choosing this route, which added a month to their journey. As they left the brutal desert that had brought so much suffering, one of the group said, Goodbye, Death Valley. And so this infamous place, one of the hottest places on earth, got its frightening name. Research and Investigation by Jerry Freeman And all this inspired Freeman. It's part of our American heritage. I believe I have a right to see it. Freeman said. It was recorded in the journals that a group of settlers made seven inscriptions along the way in 1849 to mark their passage of the route. His aim was to find the last inscription, written in 1849 by one of the travelers, said to be on the wall of Nye Canyon. Moreover, Freeman wanted to look at Dry Papoose Lake with his own eyes as this was the last place the group was before their inevitable split. He later wrote, The catch of the lake and canyon is that they are deep inside the most protected real estate on earth. Dreamland as it is. Known only to military pilots beyond the secret Area 51, to legions of UFO enthusiasts. Freeman was familiar with the group's journey, as a year ago in 1996, he led five people on the original 1849 route. They hiked for a total of 32 days. The enthusiastic team even managed to find some inscriptions. All but one. The seventh inscription, in the form of a photograph, seemed to exist only in books, along with a report of its supposed whereabouts. Freeman could not rest until his dream of seeing it was fulfilled. He once said, When you start a project, you finish it. After all, if you leave gaps in it, you don't get a sense of satisfaction. But US authorities had different opinions when it came to the dangerous journey. The National Park Service and Bureau of Land Management were favorable to Freeman's lofty goal. And the U.S. Department of Energy kindly agreed, at the explorer's request, to grant controlled access to certain parts of Area 51, which was an integral part of the expedition. The USAF, the most influential organization, was quick to approve the last group expedition, but refused permission for this one. Freeman And I'm pleased to be working with the USAF. They've made sure my team has access to several archaeological sites for several years. Papoose Lake alone is worth it. It's archaeologically critical because it was the last place the group was together in 1849. They then went their separate ways in an attempt to escape from the desert. To the Sun newspaper. USAF ignore and categorically reject all efforts by Freeman and his supporters to gain limited access to the military base. USAF stated that, From now on, will not and will not allow anyone to enter the Area 51 secret base. Freeman later said in hindsight that he tolerated all objections and remained calm, but was so naive. Hoping that at some point, the Area 51 base commander would call me and say, Hey Jerry. We've got some free time on such a day come up to the gate, our military will guide you through the day and see if we can find that inscription. Your research is admirable. Glad we could help. Obviously, this perfect scenario would never happen. Well enough with the fantasies. Now the choices are really limited. Like forgetting this important part and settling for desk research or commit unimaginable illegal infiltration? Freeman chose the latter. The USAF rejection did not stop him and he decided whether to go on his own or with a group. Radio host. 
you were refused permission several times, and then at some point, you decided to to hell with them. You went anyway? Freeman I didn't act reasonably, and I admit it, but I'm not sorry I did. As detailed in the Las Vegas Sun article series. Invasion Freeman in Top Secret Area 51 His first entry is dated Tuesday evening, April 22, 1997. Freeman says, I stood next to the rusty metal fences. An hour earlier my brother's car had disappeared down the deserted path. After a quick handshake Doyle drove off, dusk was close and shining headlights so close to the border was foolish. I convinced myself that I was only waiting for the moon to rise higher to set off, but really I was just scared. The enormity of what I was about to do undermined my courage. Finally, taking a deep breath, I stepped over the barrier into Forbidden Zone 51. Freeman wrote, I left my phone camera on in case I was arrested. I would have broadcast my position and would not have resisted arrest. Reading these memories, we realized that Freeman knew what he was signing up for from the start and was fully prepared to face the consequences. He took care to take precautions. As he had heard stories of people entering Area 51 who never returned. He says his fear dissipated as he wandered across the soothing desert. And that his first goal was to find a source of water. In the wee hours of the morning Freeman began to climb the steep slope of Skull Mountain, on the other side of the slope he saw something strange. I stopped as I stood there was an eerie, strange structure lying all over the valley. Slipping into the cover of the nearest cacti, Freeman grabbed his binoculars and began to rack his brain thinking that he had made some mistake or miscalculation and it had led him to this huge object. But he came to the horror of realizing that he was indeed in the right place. I called this place the city of the dead, because it seemed abandoned and initially all I saw was strange those structures and portable trailers. The whole valley was filled with them. Freeman accepted the reality. The huge facility he saw was surrounded by numerous guards and occupied by vehicles. It looked like a huge blockade standing between him and a source of clean water. Puzzled as to how to continue, Freeman tried to sleep in the foliage. Freeman awoke hours later to the loud whirring of helicopter blades, and he devised his ingenious plan. To go through it all now under the cover of night. He quickly decided that this was the quickest, and therefore the only way. The most effective route was a straight line, but he was soon confronted with reality. He wrote. What was a 45-minute walk became a five-hour ordeal of heartbreaking waiting. I felt like a bad actor in a prison break movie. Armed guards were everywhere. I held my breath when the high-powered lights came on. Did they suspect my presence? Freeman moved slowly through a valley filled with guards, he noticed a particularly heavily guarded building. He described it as being like a built wall, there was a single window, it was too high, and it emitted a glowing pulsating glow. But Freeman had no time to inspect the building and that was not his goal. He continued on his way, evading detection by a security car, and eventually had to walk along a paved road to reach the water source. He walked straight up to the barricade blocking the entrance to the north end of the complex and saw a large generator. Freeman wrote. It glowed like a Christmas tree and was surrounded by a cacophonous noise that was getting louder. The noise was coming from the generator, a heavy petrol-powered behemoth on wheels. Carefully dodging the strobes, Freeman moved lying down when they threatened to give him away and ran forward as hard as he could when they looked away for a moment. He stopped to catch his breath and saw a sign. Entry into Area 51 is forbidden. Violators will be prosecuted. The zone prohibits the use of firearms, cameras, telephones or binoculars. Under the control of LANLL Corporation. 
Only after he returned home did Freeman make the shocking connection. Lanel stood for Los Alamos National Laboratory Limited, National Security Science. Freeman wrote. These are the people who gave us the beginnings of all the state secrets, like the Manhattan Project which led to the development of the atomic bomb. And I wondered what these guys are working on now? It was 3 a.m., Thursday, when Freeman finally managed to find shelter in the same old miner's cabin that had saved the lives of the group from Death Valley in 1849. He reached the water source after a night's rest and filled up a full flask. Although he had planned to walk only at night, Freeman was behind schedule. And so he anxiously walked in full visibility for fear that in this light he might surely be spotted. Passing a sign that reads, Crater Danger Zone, Stay Away. Freeman realized that he had arrived at the site of an old atomic test, where some very strange secret experiments were being conducted. He hurried through the treacherous place, for there he could have been dragged underground, seemingly straight into hell. The only temporary relief was that there would be no guards in this very dangerous place. Seeing an area without vegetation, Freeman decided to throw rocks in the middle. As expected, they disappeared without a trace. So his third day at Area 51 came to an end. Freeman found somewhere to spend the night, it was a ship in the middle of nowhere. He guessed it was a trawler for atomic destruction and damage analysis, but it had been abandoned for some unknown reason. On Friday, Freeman went into scarier territory than he left behind. This is the bombing of the artillery range. He wrote. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up on end. It was the dark side of the moon. Or as one government archaeologist told me in confidence, a black hole. Freeman tells us that this area has seen the creation of the supersonic Aurora fighter jet and the legendary collection of alien spaceships stored under Papoose Lake as well as sensors that can detect an intruder and if the culprit is foolish enough to continue on their way, they are likely to be disposed of quickly. Soon Freeman realized that the phone would stop working in certain places. But if you got high enough, he could send short cryptic texts and correspondence to the sun, letting them know the status of the mission. Freeman said that, many later questioned why the authorities could not trace his phone but the confusing movements made tracking unlikely. To climb a nearby rock, Freeman used a rope and was finally able to contact his friends. He told Doyle, his brother, who was determined to pick him up after the hike. If I'm not there by midnight on the 30th, I probably won't get out. I am either lost, injured, captured or dead. He called his wife Donna to tell her that he loved her. He then told the Sun reporters. Jerry is in the mall looking for jewelry. That's code for the 1849 inscription, when the water level is below 50%, keep the faith. Freeman then crammed for the night on an unreliable narrow ledge on a high peak. Much of the diary entries are devoted to Freeman's own reflections on the motivation behind his mission, why he risked everything to come here. He writes. What an irony that 150 years after the 1840s have passed, I am desperately dodging my country's military just to see the places where people worked so bravely. It wasn't the military, it wasn't the Highlanders. They were people just like you and me, dreaming of a better life for their kin. After a while, he reached his destination, Papoose Lake, which he described as the most restricted place on Earth for entertainment. Dash, since aliens were in short supply here, Freeman could only see the helicopter chasing tourists off the property while it went unnoticed. Looking at Papoose Lake, 
Freeman felt respect for the struggles of the losing players of the 1849 group, at this very spot. He explained. This innocuous lake bottom below me was key to their survival after a journey of nearly 2,000 miles 100 men, women and children gathered here, but after arguments, their cohesion was shattered. The group that stayed behind carved a date on the wall of Nye Canyon as a sign of their being there. Freeman walked forward with unrelenting hope. But unfortunately, the search for this inscription was utterly fruitless. Scouring the vast canyon wall for one tiny, presumably weathered inscription was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. He thought that if the water supply hadn't run out, he might be able to stay another day and try his luck at finding the artifact. But Freeman was an experienced hiker. And as much as he wanted to abandon his caution and move on, he knew it was time to make the long trek back. However, he did not leave empty-handed. He had found one important relic, a bull's horseshoe. As far as Freeman knew, it was not until 1849 that oxen were driven through Nye Canyon. Freeman I'm very sorry I didn't find the inscription. But I found evidence of travelers in 1849, I was within a mile of the lake at Papoose Lake. Now there is no known photograph of Papoose Lake, but I took some. Radio host. Did you have your camera with you? Freeman. Yes, and I got great color pictures of the place and... Radio host. What did you do with those pictures? Freeman. I haven't done anything with them yet. I have a book proposal from Jeff Foreman's agency in New York. The book will be called Forbidden Journey, and I hope to include these photos, but I won't do that until I'm sure that that what I'm about to show you won't jeopardize the national security of the United States. Freeman had little time to celebrate his find as he was 22 miles from the shelter that provided him with water and shelter. Freeman began to worry. He had exhausted his water supply and his phone battery was flat. Then he reluctantly made the decision to abandon his $200 binoculars, phone, gear and cooking utensils, extra clothes and provisions and prepared for an easy and quick trip. Once a friendly shelter greeted him as darkness fell. Desiccated and very frightened of dying of dehydration, Freeman stopped at the Atomic Waste Department, a warehouse where he found a hose on the side of the building and drank as much as his heart desired. Later noting how strong the thirst was, he gave the example of Juliet Breer's quote from the 1849 group. She once said, Many times I felt that I was going to faint. That if my strength was now gone, I would fall to my knees. The boys would ask for water, but there wasn't a drop. At night, I would kneel down and look at the tracks of the oxen, who were also stumbling from exhaustion. Compared to this misery Freeman laughed at his own experience. He didn't seem to pay much attention to the fact that he was drinking water from an atomic waste facility hose. But future theorists paid attention to this detail citing it as a possible cause of Freeman's health problems on the road. Last Moments Inside Top Secret Area 51 His final moments inside Area 51 were key. He knew he could not afford to let his guard down, just not when he had come this far unnoticed. The border of a government base is no place to rest. Two hundred yards to go. Freeman wrote. I crawled and crawled, only stopping when cars could spot me. I ran up the hill without looking back and rushed over the ridge. I looked over the ground and saw a white car. It was Doyle, that was the end of the journey. Afterwards, the brothers reunited and walked in silence towards the waiting car until they were on safe ground. After a period of stern silence, Freeman asked. 
Was it a mistake, Doyle? Raising the flask in the air Doyle triumphantly replied. It wasn't a mistake, Jerry. I'm mad as hell at you, but I'm not going to accept any claim that it was for nothing. And that was the point at the end of Freeman's mission. In his passionate memoirs, Freeman remarked. If I live to be 100 years old, I will never forget the pulse pounding in those nights, what it's like to play hide and seek with ghostly men who carry combat weapons. Freeman, Events and Life Outside Area 51 But sadly, the world lost a free spirit with a good soul in 2001 when prostate cancer took Freeman. Freeman said in his lifetime that he had not planned to go public with the story because of fear of imprisonment, especially as he had never found the last inscription from 1849. After consulting with lawyers, he began to speak more freely about his experience, and shared that the military was, enraged that someone had entered unauthorized territory. Going back to the radio show recording, we found a very interesting piece that gives us more insight into what kind of sensitive information Freeman might have observed at Area 51. Radio Host Describe exactly what's in the pictures? Freeman This is a great clear picture of Papoose Lake, taken during daylight hours. I had powerful binoculars. The area looked like a dried up lake and nothing else. Radio host. That's it. Freeman. But at night, it was a different story. Radio host. What did you see? Freeman. I could clearly see the security lights around the perimeter and I could see the lights glowing and going out in the middle of the lake. I was eating and felt the vibrations. The sand started slowly sliding and I thought, well, it's an earthquake. But later I realized, no it's not an earthquake. It went on for maybe two minutes. It's something they're testing right under the ground, I could feel the vibration all the way from the whole lake. Radio host. So how much time did you spend in Area 51? Freeman. I was there for a week. Freeman hoped that his trip to the area would spark interest in American history among others. Knowing that he would be banned from working after his story went public, Freeman has given hope to other archaeologists and historians as they continue to work on finding the seventh and final inscription. Though perhaps already with the permission of Area 51. Subscribe to my channel and don't forget to like it. By doing this you are not only thanking the author, but also reminding the YouTube algorithm that you like videos with similar themes and that you can train the artificial intelligence to recommend you other authors who compose videos on similar topics.